Thank you, Phil, and thank you, uh, Charlie, like, uh, to invite me to give a talk here. It is really my pleasure. Um, so today, this is my title, Diffusion and Laplacian on the Bundle Structure and Their Applications. This is a joint work with Amit Singer, um, kind of the continuation of what uh, Amit discussed yesterday afternoon. So let me very briefly re remind you what's going on, and uh, this is actually also my main motivation of working on this field. So modern data set, which has a very different appearance compared with the data we had like 50 years ago. In particular, it's a high dimensional, and uh, for example, we have uh, medical images, and all the images can be viewed as a point in very, very high dimensional space or genetic micro, uh, microarray data, which Monica discussed a bit this morning, and uh, some kind of sleep data I work on. Like you have many complicated structure and the dimension is high, the data number is very big. Then how can you deal with this kind of data? We found that we can see it by our eyes, or by our feeling, or what people practitioners always do is, they see there are some kind of low-dimensional structure. In what sense? And how to characterize it? So, and we found that by taking this low-dimensional structure into account, we can get some new statistics to data, to, to analyze data. And this is our ultimate goal in this field, trying to say what can we do with this low-dimensional structure so that we can achieve our data analysis. In this talk, I will focus on a spatial particular low dimensional structure, which is a manifold. Suppose our data set really follows some dimensional structure, what can we do? So, for example, it is a long existing method called Graph Laplacian, which turns out to be an approximation of Laplace Biotromy operator if the graph is built up from a manifold. And this is something we will discuss later. And uh, if the frame bundle is sampled in some sense, then in the end we will get connection Laplacian. This is also what we will discuss later. We can also work with the gradient estimation because this manifold is smooth so we can have the notion of gradient and we can do some estimation of it. And it turns out that there are several works already exist in Euclidean space for dimensional reduction, which can be generalized to manifold setup, or kind of regression, or for computer scientists, it's called supervised learning or semi-supervised learning. So all this kind of stuff under manifold structure can be answered and can be really applied to some real data. And here, we more spe uh, specifically, we will focus on the principal bundle structure, and we would like to discuss its associate vector bundle structure and see what it is. So we start from cryo-EM problem, but uh, because Amit has already told you quite a lot yesterday, so I will very briefly, very quickly tell you where the manifold is and what it is. So as we as yesterday, you saw a very pretty picture about cryo-EM problem. So what we really do is we want to sample this very small molecule. And so we have many samples uh, rapidly frozen in the light ice layer. And we take this kind of X-ray transformation. And let me quickly remind you what X-ray transformation is. I have a molecule which potential is characterized by a function defined on R3, which is phi. And I can rotate our molecule according to some rotational matrix, which I uh, denoted as Ri, which is in SO3. Then X-ray transformation is defined in the following way. You have the projection. You integrate along the third direction determined by the SO3. And then the X, Y axis becomes your coordinate of the final projection. And this is what you get in the end. So it is X-ray transformation. And you can view it, and this is the ultimate, this is actually what we do. We can view this X sign, the X-ray transformation, as a diffeomorphism of SO3 to some 
you Hilbert space to, to, to a subset, which is a, in, in inside Hilbert, uh, Hilbert space. In this sense, we say that we have many data or we have many images which are located in high dimensional space and it follows SO3 manifold structure. And now I give you this structure, this, this data, and I now start to ask question. If you don't know this structure, then probably it is, you don't know what to do. But now we have this strong structure, this is SO3, and then we ask the question, what can we do and what is the problem we want to ask? And this problem can be formulated as a, as a graph data set, which we will see later. So the challenge in this problem, as mentioned yesterday by Amit, is um, this is uh, this uh, this Crowian imaging process is destructive, so the projection directions are unknown because for every image we cannot control how it or uh, how it rotates, and uh, we can only take one picture or at most right now they say three, and it's very noisy due to some physical uh, limitation. So this is the, somehow the real data you will get in the end. Very very noisy. So how can you? So, 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 how, 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 what do you want to ask from this data set? It's destructive, so you will get a bunch of images, but all the images, you don't know their the projection direction. For the ultimate purpose, that is to reconstruct the molecule itself, we need to run inverse X-ray transformation. And for inverse X-ray transformation, you need to know all, pro, all, the, all images' projection direction. But now they are not. So what we have to do is, I give you this big amount of data sets, so many images, and you need to determine first their projection direction for me so that I can run inverse X-ray transformation. So this is the ultimate goal. However, it is really too noisy. So what should we do first? Denoise. We want to increase the signal to noise ratio. Uh, traditionally, there are several different ways, for example, by applying um, um, this uh, many, many denoise, image denoising process, sparsity thresholding, heat kernel, but uh, to some extent, uh, they don't work very well in uh, this kind of noise level. The main reason is somehow because of the existing denoising algorithm are non-adaptive. Non-adaptive in the sense that we design a basis for the image, but this basis is unknown a priori to be correct or not. So if possible, we would like to take the most adaptive way to do denoise. And as far as we know, the most adaptive way is low flux number. So what we do is we would like to from uh, this, this big group of images, we would like to group all the images according to their projection direction. Suppose we can find all images with all sub, all, uh, a group of images so that they share the same projection direction but having different in-plane rotations. For example, this image and that image come from the same projection direction but different orientation different in-plane rotation. Then what we can do is we can simply align them and do averaging so that the image itself doesn't change but the noise will be uh, eliminated or be reduced. So our, our goal now, re uh, the problem is now reduced to the following. Now I have a big, uh, a large set of, a, a large data set. I want to determine their orientation, their projection direction. Then, so that we can do denoise, then the problem is how can we do it? So we come to the following question. Now what I'm doing is I give you a large, large data set and I want to classify them according to their projection direction. So somehow I need a notion of affinity so that we can say who is the neighbor of whom. And this notation of affinity uh, should be kind of robust to noise so that we are not really influenced by the noise so that we can achieve our ultimate goal. Okay, so how to do it? 
there's a simple idea, like affinity graph is a weighted graph, which you can see that it is a vertex V and H E. And for each uh, for each V, there's a data, or in our case, it's an image, and you can have a link um, among them. And we can put a weight, and we have a, oh, and this is what we call affinity graph. So this is a toy example, which is related to our problem. Suppose you have three images, Z, Z, and U. This Z and that Z looks the same to you. But if you simply take L2 known, then they are very different. However, if you think a bit more, you say, I can rotate this guy by a some, a some degrees and uh, do the subtraction, then you can say that this Z and that Z are similar. And this is what our eyes do. So this is people call it, uh, rotationally invariant distance. So what you do is you have image one, and when you compare with image two, you take some rotation and you take in. Okay, so this is something you can do to determine an affinity among images. However, there is one more information which is missed when we consider this guy. That is how we rotate two images. Now we ask the question, suppose we take this OIJ into account, can we get something better? And better in what sense? So, um, we come to the vector diffusion map, algorithm. So I will describe the algorithm first, and then I will show you uh, its geometric intuition and why we consider this problem, so that we understand why we are talking about this, why I mentioned bundle structure. And here is a bit uh, quick, and I don't uh, really discuss its application directly to cryo-EM because Amit has been already discussed it. For example, if you have two cryo-EM images, what you can do is you can apply this uh, implant rotation and get their OIJ and go get their WIJ, their weight. Yes? But if you have two images, yes. how enough do you compute uh, the classification between them? Here, this one? Yeah, I understand that uh, the definition, but mm -hmm. Yes, yes. If you need to know them, the rotation. Yes, well, there are several uh, existing algorithms that can help you to do this. Okay. Yes, and there's a fast. Yes, so this is a, the, the existence, there's no problem. So, what you can do is you run an algorithm and you can get it. And this is a vector diffusion map algorithm. So, what we do is we start from an affinity graph, and uh, on the edge, we have some OIJ, a rotational group matrix, and we call OIJ the relation group. What do I mean by the relation is how you relate to different things. And then we build up a big N by N block matrix, where each entry is a D by D matrix, so that in the end, you get a very big N D by N D matrix. Where, yes? Um, how should we think what, about how big should N be, about how big should D be, or should we not think about that? Okay, N in practice is about 10 to the fourth or 10 to the fifth, and it can be larger. And the D in many cases, for example, in cryo-EM problem, D is two, okay. because we are working with image, which is two-dimensional space. And sometimes when we work with network data, for example, in for, for this uh, multi-attribute uh, data, the D can be 10 or 20, depending on the application. So D is not so big, but N is big. Yes, N is very big. Yeah, N can be 10 to the nice. For example, in, 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 in some image problem, the N can be 10 to the nice, and the image itself can be 100, 1,000 by 1,000. So what you get is something, you just don't know how you can run it. So people have to downsample the image or reduce the size of data. Yes. Okay. And then with SIIJ, you build up a diagonal matrix, but this, this is N by N 
diagonal block matrix so that its ii's diagonal entry is nothing but the degree of i. And by degree, I mean the weight around i. So this kind of scheme, uh, if you are familiar with diffusion map, you will see that it is very similar to diffusion map or some kind of graph Laplacian. In graph Laplacian, what you do is you remove OIJ and you build up an n by n scatter matrix so that in the end you really get uh, a Markov transition matrix. And we will go to there later. But right now, this is an algorithm. And what you do is you simply build up a D inverse S in big, big matrix, which is an ND by ND matrix, which can be written in this way. Suppose you give a V of ND vector. So this is an expansion. Then we consider the following symmetric matrix, similar to D inverse S, just simply for computational purpose. Then you can find, because S theta is now symmetric, so you can find all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and then you can order eigenvectors, eigenvalues. Then you simply do the following observation. You see that by the above calculation, this S matrix, S theta matrix, if you raise to power 2t, and you consider its ij entry, and you take Hilbert Schmitt's norm, it has this kind of expansion. It is very symmetric. If you take a look, this is LOR, there's LOR, there's LOR, but there's ii, and this jj, LOR, and this is ij. So this rings the bell of inner product. So we may consider simply from this uh, linear algebra expansion the following embedding. You consider a map from I, the I's matrix, I's entry, and you map into something of very high dimensional space, which is a ND vector space. And you can see by direct calculation the Hilbert Schmitt's known is nothing but the inner product among two points. So we somehow get an, an embedding of the data point. Remember I is a vertex, which is a data. In, a, in our case, we may consider it as an object or as an image. We map this image into a very high dimensional space, L2 space, and we can define vector diffusion distance simply because this is inner product. Then you can see that we call vector diffusion map, and after the vector diffusion map, you define vector diffusion distance, which is nothing but a simple, simple subtraction and take up to L2 norm. Okay, up to now, I can tell you this vector diffusion distance is what we call by a new affinity among data points, which, you, which we can show later that it is robust to noise, so that we get a robust metric to gauge the affinity among images. In that sense, we can classify or group our images with so that all the images in one group have the same projection direction. And then we can run our implant rotation and enjoy the low of large number denoise process, denoise property. Is it clear now? OK. So, um, so this is uh, the result, which uh, some simulation result, which Amit showed you yesterday. It only tells you that vector diffusion map and this vector diffusion distance can really enjoy this kind of robustness property. If you don't take the, the, in the, this, 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 this rotation or this embedding, uh, this vector diffusion map into account, but use the previous uh, rotational invariant distance only, then you will suffer from many outliers. So one benefit of it is it's robust to noise, then you kill most of the outliers, then we are better to proceed. 
So this noise ratio, 1 over 64, is the notion of real data. It's slightly worse than the real data, but not too much worse. And the, this, this, this SNR is something very much like what you saw before, like a real data. It's very crazy. OK, I, I, give, I gave you the algorithm, but why does it work, and in what sense? So we start from um, discussing, um, give you some assumptions about manifold. So this is a general setup, which you can think MD to be SO3 if you want to consider cryo-EM problem or other manifold when they are suitable. So here I consider an embedding of manifold D into some very high dimensional space, which is a smooth, compact Riemannian manifold. And we, we endow a matrix G from the canonical matrix of RP. We just induce it. So somehow we get, that's the only, only thing we know. And we denote MT, which is the boundary. So in, our, in, in this work, because in practice, boundary is very important and we don't want to ignore it. Then we consider a data set, which is sampled from manifold according to the probability density function P, which is defined on M. So that P, have, P has some regularity, and it is bounded from below and bounded from above. It only tells you that you can sample everywhere. And you don't, and, and you get something nice. And I, I would denote P, uh, why is it here? P, Y, X, this is a pair of transport, but you will see it later. And this epsilon is some fixed constant, but it was small enough and smaller than the reach which is the, the reach is the largest radius of the normal bundle, which can be in, uh, homotopically embedded into RP, homotopic to M. Okay, so there's a, there's a problem uh, we have to answer before we proceed. That is, what do I mean by probability density function? Because we see, we know that now we are working with something random. So we have a random vector which is a random vector from uh, event space to RP. But its range is supported on some embedded manifold. It is obviously degenerate. Um, so no, it, there's no way you can say what it means by PDF in an in ordin ordinary sense. So we consider the following definition. So the X is a measurable function, and we can consider a Borel sigma algebra in a, on, on an embedded manifold. Then we can say what it means by the induced, induced probability major from a given P, underlying P, which I don't know what it is, but I say I know this. It's called induced one is P tilde X. And we make this assumption. We say that P tilde X is absolutely continuous with related to the volume major. The volume major is determined from the induced metric. So everything is given a priori so that we have this formula. And we make the further assumption saying that P is C3. And then, in this sense, for an integrable function psi, zeta, which is defined on the embedded manifold, we have this by change, uh, by change of variable. This is uh, by definition of expectation, and you change variable. Uh, no, no, this is just, a, just a, uh, this is induced major, and then, um, yeah, this is by this absolute continuous, and then you change variable, so that you see what it means by p. So p is somehow a function defined on manifold M, which is associated to the volume major V, which tells you how often you sample a point. And in this sense, we call p the PDF of a, a, a function uh, of a random variable x defined on the manifold. And there are several different possibilities to, to make the definition. But for our convenience, we choose this one. Yes? Which omega? This omega? Yeah. Mm, that this, this omega is the probability space, is the event space. We start from, we don't know what it is. But, but I mean, 
can you not choose it to make something convenient? What, what would be the most convenient choice as Omega? Mm, to me, I don't know. Because just like in probability, if I give you a random variable, then the most thing you can answer is what is the distribution of, it, of its value. And if you ask me what is the event space, then what I can say is it is maybe uh, given by the God. I don't know what it is. So I don't characterize the omega at all here. Maybe if you put some structure, you can get something better, but I don't do it here. Okay, then the second assumption we make is we will have a principal bundle uh, come with the manifold M, um, where G is a Lie group. And I will also assume that there is a unitary representation of the Lie group on some, Euclidean uh, on some Euclidean space Rm, where M may be some just positive m integer. And then I denote E to be the associated vector bundle of the principal bundle with respect to the representation. So um, a working example is you can consider uh, G to be OD, where D is the dimension of the manifold. And you consider a trivial principal bundle so that its associate vector bundle will become a tangent bundle. And PYX is always denoted as the parallel transport from X to Y. And we put, for the sampling issue, we put one more condition. That is, for every sampled point, we also have a sample GI on the principal bundle, on the, on the fiber, on its fiber. And I will denote O as the representation group. No, I don't, at this moment, I don't care about it. I just say for every point, I have one thing. I care about it when I want to reconstruct the principal bundle itself. But now I want to construct M. Yes. yes, the and principal it bundle. With the of the uh, it is, uh, no, it is not with the Lie group, yes. Yeah, it is just, uh, it is uh, this metric, uh, this, uh, yes. And here, rho and m depend on the application. So for example, there are three particular examples we can consider. The first one is, as I mentioned, if your rho G is in some OM act on RM. Yes? I'm sorry. Yep. The thing is, if you consider rho to be unit representation of G on RM, because you know, RM is a real space. Yes. And unit representation, what, the, what do you mean the unit representation? Of it's OM. It is, o, it is by unitary, I mean OM. Ah, it is uh, orthogonal. Yes, orthogonal representation. Okay. Yes, and you can surely consider uni unitary yeah, representation yeah. on UM. Yeah, if you can see work with complex space. Yeah. And then, if the principal bundle is, for example, principal bundle is the frame bundle itself, and uh, you have a standard representation on the RD, then you get tangent bundle. And in this case, you recover the vector diffusion algorithm. And this can be applied for cryo EM. Or you can consider this representation, which becomes a Z2 X on R. Then somehow you get, you can view it as a Z2 bundle, principal bundle over the manifold. And uh, this build up will lead to, will lead to the orient, uh, dif orientable diffusion map which we will discuss later, which allows us to reconstruct or get the orientability of a manifold orient. And if you can simply consider trivial representation of G on R, that is, it is always identity, then this is the diffusion map algorithm. And this is some uh, illustrative picture that is, this is torus T2, and this circle at each point is the fiber. And so suppose you have a sample point Xi and Xj, 
mark it as red points, then you also give you, you also have a sample point G R G J on the fiber. This is what the how the pic how, how how the sample data points look like. And then we we want to I tell you so many assumptions. Oh, why why should I? Uh, because then we can run vector diffusion map on this data set. But how? We build up a vertex, a graph V, which where vertex is just the sampling points, and E is the gra is the edges, where the edges are linked if two points are very close, where epsilon is determined as we mentioned before, it's a small positive number. Then we can choose a kernel which decays fast enough, and we can define this kind of weight, which tells you that if two points are very close, then you give it a very large weight. And if two points are far away, then you give it a very small weight. So this is something very much like, you can think it from the Markov process. If two points are very close, then the probability you jump from one point to another is high, but if two points are very far away, far apart, then you jump from one point to another one is very slow. Very, the probability is small. Then you can define W matrix, which is an N by N matrix, by some OWIJ, and then you define DII, where you sum OIJ. Then you fix some alpha, which is in between zero and one. Then you can define an N by N matrix similarly by what we considered before, but slightly different. So here, W alpha, if you think it more carefully, it is actually a normalized kernel, but not really what we want as a vector diffusion map. In particular, if you consider W1, that is you take alpha to be one, then this guy becomes Wij divided by these two numbers. And what are they? If you view this guy, as the probability density function estimation at point xj, then what we do right now is we normalize the probability density function. We want to get rid of the non-uniform density issue. This is what W alpha do. And then we define the relation group Oij to be rho Oi rho Oj. What we do is we view each representation as a group, and we kind of find their relationship by transformation. And you will see what it means later. And we define an ND by ND matrices by, lift, by this way. If, uh, if you remember, this S alpha is what we considered before, but right now we use W alpha to become our to be, be, be our weight, Wij, and the d alpha is the same as before. Then we consider this guy, which is a symmetric matrix, so that we can run eigenvalue decomposition and do, define this vector diffusion map, and uh, then we can define the vector diffusion distance and so on. So there are in total seven steps in a vector diffusion algorithm. If you want to count them, you start from the sampling points, and you give a weight, and then you define a matrix to normalize the non-uniform, possibly non-uniform probability density function, and then you run the final vector diffusion map. Okay, so before we go to the theory, you see on step five, you take the full assays, you know the all the information about your fiber. You can really assess the fiber. This is what this equation tells you. But however, in practice, maybe you are not so lucky. You cannot assess the, really assess the fiber. For example, suppose you are working with the frame bundle, and this frame bundle is something has been embedded into the Euclidean space, RP. That is, I give you a sample of OI, in, in frame bundle, and I embed them, I embed them to the, the D to the p dimensional space, so that for qi it is actually become a p times d 
matrix. So we replace step five by the following alignment algorithm if we want to run the vector diffusion algorithm. And what does it mean? It means that suppose we have manifold MD, and uh, for the case one, we have full access to the principal bundle. Then we can run everything here by taking all the information we have, like parallel transport or whatever we want, and do the analysis. But if we are not so lucky, we get some embedding I, we embed everything to the Euclidean space, and the only access we have is the embedded basis, then how can you estimate the parallel transport, or how can you estimate the principal bundle to be safe? structure so that you can run the algorithm. Then, as you can see, this is precisely the model for cryo-EM. Because in cryo-EM, we have SO3 here, but we have an X-ray transformation here. So in the end, we only have the SS2 the embedded manifold. And we want to recover SO3 or S2 here. So this is the, fine, this is the, 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 the real relationship. In underlying relationship uh, in between vector diffusion map and cryo EM. So what can we do? So we want to estimate OIJ. What we can do is simply by taking OIT, uh, QIT, QJ, and we fit it to some, we fit it by some orthogonal matrix. Notice that why should we do it? Because QIT, QJ is actually not in OD because we have curvature. Remember, if after embedding, this embedded tangent plane and its basis is not the same as the embedded tangent plane of XJ. So if they are different, if the two, two points are departed from by, by, by some distance, square root of epsilon, then they are different. So you cannot expect QIT, QJ to be in OD. So you have to do something to correct it. And in the end, we really get OIJ. And you will see that, again that OIJ is really an estimator of the parallel transport from XJ to XI. In this sense, we say we recover our SS to the frame bundle. And this is how the parallel transport means. It means that if we if there's some topological information which, which don't allow us to do something. And uh, if you remember what Amit showed you yesterday about this, this hair comp, yeah, hairy ball theory. Yeah. And uh, so I will state all the theorems by the second case. That is, we have indirect access to the frame bundle. The theorem one is, suppose two points xi and xj are small, and we have some, for example, uh, vector field, which is C3, but this is not really important at this moment, then with high probability, OIJ is related to the parallel transport in the following sense. And then you can see what's going on here. It tells you that you have, uh, when you have vector field at point xj, you embed it. And after you embed it, you evaluate its coordinate, and then you do transportation, OIJ. This is a relationship group we call. So that in the end, what you really get is you do trans parallel transport from XJ. This is intrinsic parallel transport. And after you do parallel transport, you embed it into the Euclidean space, and you evaluate its coordinate. So QOIJ is really something we can use to approximate the PXIXJ, that is the parallel transport, up to some older, third, older arrow. And then, with this uh, alignment theorem, we can consider this one. Uh, we, we, can, we, can, we can proceed. We say, we are really, the, the, full, the whole algorithm is actually an approximation of identity plus a low large number. So what we can tell first is k epsilon, suppose this is the definition of k epsilon, then if you remember, this guy is 
w. This is t. Uh, let me remind you. This is t. We have wij is this guy. This is called, called k epsilon. And we have w and d. And this is w alpha is d inverse uh, d to the minus alpha, w d in, to the minus alpha. And this guy turns out to play the role of estimated probability density function. And you have a normalized kernel, which plays the role that you want to kill the influence of probability density function, where alpha is in between 0 and 1. And the theory tells us that with high probability, by applying low flush number or and a large deviation theory, this guy is nothing but an integration, an integral kernel. And this integral kernel T epsilon alpha is defined in the following way, as you can see. You have this new kernel, K epsilon alpha, and the parallel transport, which you take intrinsic structure into account, and you have probability density function here. And you have some kind of error. This error epsilon to uh, three health comes from the indirect access to the principal bundle because you have to estimate a parallel transport, and this is the error introduced when you estimate parallel transport. And this is the low of large number. This is the error introduced by large deviation theory, telling you that by choosing some epsilon, which is the kernel bandwidth, and the number of points, they play, they play a role together so that you can say with some probability you will have this bound. Then we have some, this is the, just some definition of the constant. We can ignore them. Then we say, suppose x is not near the boundary. Remember this notation means the, bound, uh, the set near the boundary. And we say x is in C3. We have some regularity. Then you can just view T epsilon X. T epsilon alpha as the uh, approximation of identity, and you will get xx plus epsilon times connection Laplacian and this guy, which involves P and gradient of x. So as you can imagine, if you take alpha to be 1, which means that you really normalize the kernel, you take the full estimation of the PDF into account, you normalize the kernel, then in the end, you really get the Laplace, uh, the connection Laplace. And near the boundary, we may have something worse, because as you can, you can imagine, what we have for kernel is symmetric. So on the boundary, we suffer from uh, the, boundary, uh, the boundary effect. The kernel is no longer symmetric, so the first order term cannot be killed. So we don't get anything, uh, we don't get the thing as good as previous case. That is, we get second order error. We only get the first order error, which is a parallel transport of the gradient where partial d is the outer normal at x0. So you can see that this operator have different behaviors inside the kernel, inside the manifold, and near the boundary. So we put everything together, all this together. We say, asymptotically, when epsilon is of this order, when xi is not near the boundary, then we have this following point-wise convergence, which tells you that if you take this operator into account and you apply to x bar, what is x bar? x bar is the estimated, is actually not estimated, is the coordinate of the vector bundle, of, 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 of a vector field with related to the frame, the, the frame. You are working with a coordinate. Then, once this is acted, you evaluate on the ice point, you really get the embedded connection operation, act on x, evaluate at xi, and you find its coordinate. If you take alpha to be 1, you see that you reconstruct the connection operation point-wisely. 
but point-wise convergence is not strong enough for us to work with real problem. We'll come back to this later. The theory of near the boundary tells us that asymptotically we will get something of first order, square root of epsilon. And if you do some calculation, you will see that we need, in the end, some homogeneous Neumann boundary condition of the connection Laplacian. That is, in the end, what we really get is the connection Laplacian with Neumann boundary condition. Otherwise, you will get blow up near the boundary. And then we come to the spectral convergence issue. We first define this discretized version of the T epsilon 1 upper integral operator, which is defined in the following way. What you do is you re replace xi by y, simply. Then you get this integral operator. And the theory tells us that there is a one-one relationship of eigenvalue and eigenfunctions between this discretized integral kernel and the D inverse, uh, D1 inverse S1, which is this guy is our diffusion map algorithm. So we consider this continuous version of the discretized version, continuous analog of discretized, discretized version. And we can consider this because there is a one-one relationship. So we can do all the analysis of D1 inverse S1 by taking the x hat, t hat epsilon 1 into account. Then we suppose we have their eigenvalue, eigenfunction, and so on. And we fix some time positive. And we consider this guy. And consider the eigenfunction, the, the heat value, heat, heat, heat kernel. Then for given i, if you fix it, then there exists some epsilon n, which goes to 0, such that the eigenvalue converges. And the eigenvector field converges in probability. And in this sense, we say that D1 inverse S1 converges in a spectral sense to the heat kernel. And then also to uh, the connection Laplacian. And also, this is why we call VT vector diffusion map, because we are really working with something of diffusion. Yes. Excuse me. Do you, do you have to assume that there is no multiplicity of eigenfunction in the in the continuous space? Oh, here. Okay. So this is a good point. Here, um, we make the assumption that all the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions are of multiplicity one to simplify the discussion. Because if we consider multiple or uh, the multiplicity, then what we have we will have is the eigenfunction, eigenvalue will converge, and this guy will converge in a spec in, in the, the, the eigenspace will converge. We will get eigenvector eigenspace convergence, but not eigenvector convergence. But the eigenspace in the discrete analog would probably not have multiplicity. So in so in what sense do the eigenspace if in the end exponential e uh, exponential to t Laplace square you have multiplicity, then we can show that this guy will have either discretized version, but in the end it will converge to this eigenspace. Okay. So here we just talk about multiplicity one for simplicity. And this is an, an immediate example for your question. For example, for S2, S3, S3, S4, S5, you can see the multiplicity is 6, 10, 14. And for S3, it is 4, 9, 4, uh, 4 6, 9, blah, blah, blah. And you can see this number by running vector diffusion map. This is the multiplicity of S2, 6, 10, 14. And this result are from 2,000 points sampled from the manifold.
and the vector diffusion map and vector diffusion distance can be understood by taking the continuous version a heat kernel into account. So this is the heat kernel, and you can evaluate its Hilbert Schmitz known at x, y, and it looks like this looks like this guy, which is similar to what we saw before. Then the vector diffusion map of M can be defined in a similar way. Now we are considering a continuous version, and in the end we see that the heat kernel is nothing but the uh, Hilbert uh, inner product of the uh, of the vector diffusion map. And then we can define what vector diffusion distance is on the manifold again. And uh, the important property of vector diffusion map in the end is for any T, this is a diffeomorphic embedding. But the more important property is suppose you have two points, X and Y, their geodesic distance is V, which is very small. Then you will get this relationship telling you that the vector diffusion distance among x and y are somehow related to the vector diffusion, uh, the geodesic distance. So in this sense, we can get back the geodesic distance. And recall that previously, by this embedding, there is a weighted, there is a weight in front. So in the end, we don't need the whole eigenspectrum. We only need the first few eigenvectors so that we can fully recover the distance, the geodesic distance, or fully recover geodesic distance up to some controllable error. And for the purpose of classification, we don't need the precise, precise distance. We only need something up to some control. So in this sense, in the end, what we need is just simply the first few eigenfunctions or eigenvector fields. And in this sense, this method is robust because of the random matrix theory property. So we benefit from vector diffusion map compared with the transitional diffusion map or prop, uh, uh, approach because traditional diffusion map property. Uh, okay, I didn't mention it, but uh, for transitional eigenvector, traditional diffusion map, you need more eigenfunctions to recover what you want, but we don't discuss it here. So, yes? <laughs> okay, so I will just very quickly speak uh, uh, a bit and we can stop. So what I want to say is, up to now I tell you something like we have an ideal situation, we know really the principal bundle, or we have the full SS, or uh, we know the embedding. But in practice, we may only have a point cloud. And from the point cloud, we still have interest to know if there is any, any information about vector field or form or topology. What can we do? We have to reconstruct the principal bundle. By what? By reconstruct or estimate the embedded tangent bundle. And how to estimate in the embedded tangent bundle we run local PCA. As Amit mentioned yesterday, very quickly, we run local PCA, then we can estimate the, esti uh, the embedded tangent bundle. And this is a theory that tells us that vector uh, local PCA can help us to get an approximation of the embedded tangent bundle. And use this embedded tangent bundle, we can approximate the frame bundle structure. And in this sense, in this case, not really in this sense, but in the end, we can show that all these arrows are neglectable asymptotically. So in this sense, we can recover the connection operation of the tangent bundle so that we can get somehow the H1 plus some Ricci curvature information. Okay, so I just say that we, with this approach, we can do something, several different new things. For example, we can build a new Laplace Biotromy operator with non Neumann boundary condition, and uh, this kind of approach is directly related to regression problem, a manifold, which we can do, still do something. And, um, we can have this orientability detection, which I don't have time to discuss. Then, okay, thank you very much. Yes. So um, there was this 
parameter alpha d divided by uh, d to the, what is it, 1 minus alpha? Yes. Okay. Okay. Why, why should we ever take alpha anything except one? Okay. So, for vector bundle case, at this moment we don't have any answer. We will expect that to be related to some quantum field theory, but we don't know anything about it yet. For diffusion map case, that is, if you take the trivial trivial representation into account, everything holds, and here will become la bla f and nabla p to the alpha. And this turn, if you do some transformation of p is the log of some potential u, yes. then you can link the whole process to the Schrodinger equation. Okay. Then that is what they call, uh, for example, Koichman had a paper in 2005 saying that if you have a Schrodinger equation and you have a potential, then the trajectory will be located or sampled mm -hmm. according to the PDF the probability density function, but this probability density function is determined by the potential, which makes sense because you have potential at some place, and the pot if when the potential is high, you don't show up very often or something. Yes, and in this sense, we consider some alpha, which is not one. And they can use that one to detect the dynamical behavior of the system. And we expect in the beginning that suppose alpha is not one, we may get something interesting but at this moment, I just don't know how to make it interesting. Okay, so, so, for, your, so for, for your algorithm, alpha should be one, but these formulas may be, I mean, are applicable to things other than, than your algorithm, and therefore you want to use the freedom. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so if someone know, <laughs> knows how to apply it, they will be wonderful. I just don't know. <laughs>